Hello and welcome to part 4, the final part of the Spitfire tutorial series. So what have we covered so far? Well in part 1 we looked at the exterior, the interior of the aircraft and some important features. In part 2 we then moved on to our initial checks, startup, testing the installations. In part 3 we actually took off in the aircraft, we finally took to the skies and then we looked at climbing and cruising. Poor weather, poor visibility and some other bits and pieces that hopefully were of interest to you and useful to you. And now finally in part four, what are we going to do to be bringing it home? So first off, we're going to uh, just go through some additional pieces of information that hopefully will be useful. Then we're going to look at aerobatic characteristics, not a complete aerobatic course, just really talking about a couple of key features of the spit and also looking at dives. And then we're going to finish off with approach, landing, and actually finally shutting the aircraft down at the end of the flight. Well, here we are in a nice cruise with Little Hampton just off our right there, down in West Sussex. So before we go ahead and do anything else, we'll just jump into the cockpit going to cover a, a few bits and pieces that we haven't looked at yet that might be of interest to you and might also maybe just answer a few questions. Um, you might have seen things in the cockpit and wonder what that's all about. Okay so here we are, it's gone a little bit dark outside but that's okay, it's light enough inside the cockpit for us to see what we're doing. Um, yeah, you may have noticed or you may not have noticed this little red tag here. Now that's actually preset. Uh, really it would have been preset by the fitter as pilots were not clever enough to know these things so we're not really trusted to fiddle with them and nor should we need to. But this is really just telling you information that would have been set by the fitter depending on the aircraft and engine configuration that you've got. Now this one here is set to uh, plus four boost which really is the, the maximum normal boost that you would have uh, say for example if you're cruising or um, just flying straight and level. Um, you can adjust it using this uh, little knob here. I can honestly say I never really use it. I tend to fly off the figures but that is what that is all about. It doesn't actually change anything or control anything in the aircraft. You can see I can move it around and nothing happens. Um, but it's really just there, as I say, as a marker so that you can uh, just have a reference point. It can be quite handy, especially when you're starting off. Uh, you can use it to set a particular boost level for maybe a target level, a target boost level that you are looking to achieve in a certain situation. But that really is what that's all about. It was just the fittest way of reminding the pilot here, don't mess about. The other thing that's worth just uh, understanding how it works is um, the lights if we were flying at night and it's a little bit dark with this overcast but as you can see we've got some sun coming into the cockpit here but you'll be able to see the effect is of the uh, interior cockpit lights um, you've got two controls here you've got port and starboard very simple these are your lights here so we'll turn them on see the left one has come on, or port, seeing as we're being aeronautical, and your starboard one has come on. You can actually move these by left clicking on them and then just kind of dragging them around like this with the uh, with the mouse. Um, it just helps if you want to get the right angle when you're flying at night. You can fly at night in this, obviously it's kitted out primarily as a VFR. Um, you haven't got a sat nav or anything like that. Talk a bit more about that in a bit, um, but uh, at least that means you can actually see what you're doing by your instruments. Okay, so let's talk about boost cutout, which is this red lever here, uh, or rather boost cutout override, which is what it really is. Um, this is something if you, it, uh, it depends how you fly it, it depends, it depends how you approach it. If you want to approach it as if you are a brand new Battle of Britain pilot and you're going to throw this around and you're going to use it as if you're in combat, then this is something that you probably want to uh, to look at. 
um, for the kind of flying that I do, which is uh, restored warbird flying, um, you know, flying it from uh, A to B, doing some aerobatics, uh, that kind of thing, it's not something I honestly use. Boost cutout override was there so that in combat you had that extra bit of power when you actually needed it and that's primarily what it's all about. It doesn't do the engine particularly uh, much good uh, if you're using it on a um, you know on a frequent basis and in the early days uh, I think Dowding was uh, getting a bit fed up with people overusing <laughs> this thing because it doesn't do much good for your engine. So really what is it doing? Um, because the Merlin is such a beast they actually limit the engine uh, to certain levels so if you're looking at the Mark 1 it's actually limited to six and a quarter pounds per square inch boost and uh, the Mark uh, 2 was nine pounds per square inch. How do they do this? They do this really by uh, adding uh, an, an in, uh, adding a vent in the intake that allows this excess pressure to escape. So what we're doing when we use the boost cutout override is we're actually sliding a plate over this vent so that this, this pressure can't escape. And what that means is that we get that, the advantage of that extra pressure on, in the intake, which means that both in the Mark 1 and the Mark 2, you can get up to 12 boost. So let's see what happens when we actually apply that. So, as I say, it's not something I use very often, but I'm going to show you. In the sim, it works slightly differently to the real aircraft. Because of the quirk of the controller, you have to rock the... Uh, throttle back a little bit once you've once you flick this tab and then push it forward. So let's see what happens. There we go. Now why is that shaking so much? That's shaking like that, and we're going to just give it a rest. That's shaking like that because the propeller is all the way in course. It's in the course cruise configuration. So that's just to give you an idea of what happens when you apply that when the propeller is in the incorrect position. Let's now set it to fine. And let's do that again. So flick that, pull back, push it forward, and now we're getting our 12 boost. We've gone past our 3000 RPM, and you can see suddenly we have got that increase in speed. There we go. Let's pull the RPM back now. Now of course that's great. It gives you that uh, that extra increase of power when you need it in a dogfight. What it also does, as you can see from our radiator temperature down here, is that it suddenly increases speed, uh, increases temperature rather, which, <laughs> as with a lot of these things, there's a downside to it. You get extra power, but you get increased temperature and then that's just another thing that the pilot has to manage. So pros and cons. Now as you can see here we are back in the gorgeous Mark 1. Uh, we're just going to cover a couple of little things in this aircraft. One which is very specific to this aircraft and a handy little tip. Okay, so something that is common to both the Mark 1 and the Mark 2, and probably a lot of aircraft, I should think, especially this era, is there is a discrepancy between the uh, the uh, the indicated airspeed as we see it here in miles an hour, and I guess what you would call a true indicated airspeed, or rather what we call the calibrated airspeed, and this takes into account the uh, the slight built-in error into the actual instrument itself, the system in the in the cockpit. If you look in your instruction manual you'll actually see that there is a uh, table that uh, gives you some kind of guidance on this and for example we are travelling at the moment at 230 miles an hour. If we look at the table, the table tells us that uh, at 200 miles an hour on the clock we're actually doing 193 miles an hour so you've got a 7 mile an hour difference. At 250 miles an hour, we would be doing 240 miles an hour calibrated airspeed. So there you've got a 10 mile an hour difference. We're doing 230, so you can work that out at somewhere around 222, 221 miles an hour. And 
So that gives you your calibrated airspeed and that's what you'd want to be using if, for example, you were converting uh, indicated airspeed or calibrated airspeed into ground speed or true airspeed. Okay, now you might remember from uh, the first uh, part that we did uh, where we were talking about props and I said that there was a cool little trick with the two-speed prop uh, that pilots in the uh, early stages of World War II actually found they could use to give more uh, more settings, uh, make their prop even more variable than it already was. So just to recap, effectively with this two-speed propeller, hence the name, we have two settings. We have coarse and we have fine. And at the moment we're in a nice cruise, uh, 2000 RPM, we've got plus two boost, we're doing just over 240 miles an hour and we're cruising along quite nicely. Now um, what they actually found was that if we, if I move down here so you can actually see, you've actually got some play in between the two. So just to recap, two, uh, 2000 RPM on the clock there and we're doing just over 240 miles an hour with boost plus two. If I now start to ease that back and I'll see if I can get everything in the shot here. So I'm just ever so gently easing that back. You see our RPM has just gone up. We're now doing 2200 uh, 2, RPM. Still got boost plus two and our speed is going to, if I, I don't think you'll see the cursor if I move over it, but the speed is just increased a shade. If I now move it just a little bit further, that's only a slight movement. We've gone to two and a half thousand, oh no, just dropping down a bit. There we go, two and a half thousand RPM there. Our speed is now 248 miles an hour, 249 miles an hour. Now, ever uh, so slightly again, now we've gone up to 2800 RPM. And what's our speed now? Staying round about the same to be fair. At 248, something like that. And now, a little bit more, and now we're just over the 30,000, or sorry, 3,000, 30,000. So that really kind of, kind of gives you an idea of, uh, of what you can do. If I now put it in fully fine, really not much in it. So it's staying around about 3,000 revs. Uh, let me just put the boost back up to two and we're what 245 246 on the clock so that really kind of gives you an idea um, of where there is some play in it so you can get a little bit more flexibility remember the the prop settings really are almost like gears in the car so effectively by adjusting this plunger slightly i call it a plunger i know it's not a plunger but <laughs> for some reason that's set in my mind um, that uh, that actually uh, will will give you those extra gears, as it were, and you can just have a have a, a play with them on the fly. Good idea is to take the Mark One up with that two-speed propeller on it and just have a play with it. I'm going to turn the RPM down now before we blow the engine up. There we go. Um, one of the disadvantages of this is that as a pilot. If you think back to the fixed pitch propeller, our little wooden fixed pitch propeller, um, that's really only got one setting on it. So if you get into a situation, for example, where you're in a dive, uh, you've got the air pushing against the propeller and it's actually driving it up. It's driving up the RPM. Uh, the only way you can really sort of back out of that is to, for example, say pull out of the dive pull back a little bit on the throttle but generally you're not wanting to do that a great deal anyway um, but it gives you basically what you're doing is now as we are now with our uh, two-speed propeller um, 
once you've adjusted it, once you've put it in that setting, it's really behaving as a two uh, a, a fixed pitch propeller. Sorry. So, for example, if I was to go into a dive now, I've effectively got a fixed pitch propeller set at two thousand RPM, and the uh, this the airflow over the propeller is going to speed it up. And this is where the Rotol constant speed propeller comes in because what, what's happening there is our governor is now making sure that within parameters, governor will always try and uh, you know keep that setting for you. So the pilot effectively isn't having to do so much work. So while we're just in the climb here, just something else just to point out to you so that you remember, remember this is Akisim and Akisim is going to talk to you. If you see blue smoke, that means you're burning oil. Have a look at your oil temperature gauge, see where your temperature is there. If the temperature is too high, hence your blue smoke, you need to come back on the RPM just to uh, reduce the friction in there and come back on the power a little bit as well. If on the other hand you see black smoke, that'll be unburnt fuel and that's probably because you've pulled back on the throttle and not all the fuel is getting burnt and also you've got a risk of fouling your plugs. Okay, so let's talk about diving. Probably not something you can do a great deal of uh, if you are just flying it normally but it's worth uh, knowing about it and knowing what you need to do. Um, really in both the Mark 1 and the Mark 2, the maximum diving speed is 450 miles an hour indicated airspeed and you've even got it there carved into the uh, into the cockpit into the instrument panel so that you don't forget that you also need to remember your RPM settings in relation to the throttle so at less than a third throttle the maximum continuous RPM is permitted at 3000 RPM if the throttle is at least a third open, then you can go to 3,600 RPM momentarily until it settled down to 3,000 RPM or less. At no time must you, the throttle be closed if the RPM becomes excessive, uh, if you're trying to reduce the RPM because you're worried that it's, it's racking up. Do not uh, you know, close the throttle to try and achieve that. If you've got the constant speed air screw, which is what we've got on here, then the RPM is going to remain constant in the dive uh, within the governor limits, and that, but that's going to be 1,700 to 3,600 RPM. Uh, so if you if you're picking up a speed above, if you're picking up a speed where the airflow over the propeller is so high that the governor can't cope with it, then it's going to increase past 3,600. 3,600 RPM and then you kind of get into a bit of trouble. Uh, with the fixed bridge or the two speed um, then uh, you need to be careful because you've got no governor so therefore the possibility of over speeding the propeller is, uh, is a lot higher. So that's something that you need to be uh, careful of and certainly where you've got the two speed propeller installed that needs to be in the fully course position. Uh, when you've got the constant speed as we've got installed then the air screw uh, or propeller would be set back in the uh, full course position also before we actually start the dive and that present, prevents the air screw from jamming into fine pitch. A couple of figures to remember the minimum RPM permissible at maximum boost on the Mark 1 is 2080 RPM on the Mark 2 is 2270 RPM not too worried about that one we're not going to be using maximum boost here but that's just another figure to to bear in mind okay so the other thing to remember is at high air speeds the spit tends to be a bit uh, tail heavy which means the nose comes up you can kind of see that here you can see from our our trim indicator down here that even at this uh, this nice steady cruise that we're doing now um, we're doing uh, what 2000, uh, 230 miles an hour indicated, which we were doing 2300, oh, that would be quite something. Um, we've already got some nose down there just to keep us at, uh, at a uh, constant altitude. Um, what we do in the dive is we actually have to trim the aircraft 
to make sure that we're keeping that dive attitude without actually having to pull back on the column uh, or adjust the column, adjust the elevator using the column uh, and when we then come to pull out gently it means that we're not putting excessive G on the aircraft. So we need to do this quite quickly because we don't want the speed to build too much so let's see what happens. Just another note and a reminder as you can see we're starting off quite high that's always a good thing to do. Okay so as we said propeller to course and let's flip her onto her back so we don't flood that engine and let's go into a dive. Checking the wing, watching the speed, trim 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 and let's pull out nicely done and then let's stabilize so we put our prop back okay let's talk a bit about aeros this isn't going to be a course on how to do aerobatics uh, you may already know how to do that um, and if not there's uh, it's a whole different a whole extra subject to talk about. Um, it's really just to uh, give you an indication of uh, the settings I guess really for the spit. I used to make the mistake of thinking that I had constantly had to chock the throttle and change things and all that kind of stuff whereas actually most of the time it appears that a display pilot will have a, a setting for aerobatics and from there on it's kind of speed management, energy management uh, and flying it that way. So uh, in the Spitfire uh, what we're looking at for our um, uh, aerobatic settings are uh, plus 6 boost and uh, 2600 RPM. So we'll just bring around over here and we'll just do a simple loop just to demonstrate that Okay, so 300 miles is the ideal for a loop uh, or you can, if you're feeling a bit braver and you know what you're doing, 200, 250 miles an hour. So let's just drop the nose a little bit. RPM's dropped a little, check the temperature, we're okay. We've got 300, pull back on the stick gently. Now let's go over to the wing, just have a look at those wing tips, bring it up over the top. Now we start to look over, horizon is level, bring it down, keep those wings level. And there we have our loop. So quite simple, RPM just slightly above there but we bring it back that way. For a roll, again really very simple, you probably know what you're doing with that, but we pull the nose up slightly and then start to roll and then when we're in the, uh, how would you call it where the wings are vertical, we're just using a bit of rudder to act as an elevator just check our setting again and that's good Come back down, build up some speed, checking temperature, that's okay, it's under 110. Now let's come back. And we're going to open our radiator one notch. 
temperature is getting a little bit high there on the radiator after doing those aeros, so we'll just let it cool off a little bit. Remember, one of the things with the spit is uh, watching those temperatures. Okay, so here we are coming into Goodwood now, we're in a nice cruise configuration, we're just going to go overhead the race course here, and then we're going to do a pass over Goodwood, do a break, that'll lose us some speed, and then come in for a nice curved approach. The reason we do the nice curved approach as opposed to a long straight in is because that long nose gives us very little visibility and also a long straight slow approach does wonders for overheating your radiator quick hello to Goodwood the race course that is so I'm going to do it this stage let's just bring around I'm going to put the mixture rich at this stage. I'm not going to do much with anything else. We're not doing aerobatics, we're just doing a nice smooth approach. Or other pass. So speed is, uh, what's that, about 260 miles an hour. Break. Don't want to go too high. I'm going to come off on the power. At the same time, I'm going to go fully fine on the prop. Bring us round. And we're now down to about 160 miles an hour pretty much where we want to be for gear. Right, this stays quick check. Uh, we are fine. We are rich. We are going to open the canopy. Lower the speed a little bit. Okay, start our turn. As we start to turn, the speed goes below 106 miles an hour. We drop the gear, keeping an eye on. It's a lot easier to do this with track IR, I must admit. Keeping an eye on that runway. Keeping an eye on our speed. We're not going to drop the flap until the last minute because it's just a dirty big brake. This isn't the flaps that you see in your Cessna. Bring around, keep losing the speed, here we come, 120 miles an hour, drop the flap and anticipate the nose dropping, there it goes, hold it, course correct, drop throttle, nose back flare, and we're down. Okay, now we raise flaps. Just till they're in nice, you can open the radiator fully, that's there. Always 
back on the elevator. Well, we've got the power on, keep that tail down. Put a brake now, just take us around the corner. Out, make sure we're not going to bump into anything. This is where your rest turns come in as well. temperatures. It's very embarrassing if you pull up and the chief engineer sees you with the steaming radiator. Let's just swing around now. Okay, let's have the handbrake on. Parking brake, handbrake, not in the car. Okay, so we put our throttle to round about 800 to 1000 RPM, just so it's running there. I'm going to close the fuel cock. And now we wait for it to start running roughly. There it goes, just starting to shudder then. Okay. Pulling that ring down there, that's the um, slow running cutout. Everything off. Check, Peter heat is also off. And there you have it. We've landed. We've survived. And that's the end of our flight. So this brings us to the end of part four and also the end of the series. I really do hope that you found this useful, that it's been of interest to you and that you've enjoyed it. And the next steps really, if you haven't already, are to really have a look at the manual and go to the A2A simulations forum check out the Spitfire section in there, look at the technical support and look at the excellent materials that have been put together by people there. I've mentioned it before, Kill Ratio has done some amazing written tutorials on radiator management and that sort of thing. Uh, this guy knows his stuff and he has helped me a great deal uh, while I've been trying to, uh, to get to grips with the Spitfire over the last few years. He really does know his stuff and I urge you to have a look at the information that he's posted up there because it's incredibly useful. The other thing I'd do is uh, check out the multiplayer section. Look at the multiplayer section of the forum and look and see what flights are coming up because every now and again a Spitfire flight will come up and they're a great bunch of guys on the multiplayer group, uh, the Misfit Squadron as it's affectionately known. Um, these guys know what they're talking about. It's always good fun and you learn something as you're going along as well because there's guys there who are very experienced and every now and again you might get a little nugget of information come through. So well worth having a look at that. But in the meantime, thank you very much for watching this series. As I say, hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you on the channel soon.